Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. Love, peace, joy. You know, as we read later in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, we're told that heaven is a place where God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Later on in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 21, it describes heaven as the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Jesus himself told us in John chapter 14, verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You see, every description we have of heaven in the Bible speaks of a place that we should look forward to spending eternity in. To put it in a real-life perspective, It's a place of no crime, no disease, no violence, no fear. So for in other words, if we had cars there, we wouldn't have to lock them at night because nobody would steal it. In our mansions, we won't have to lock our front door because nobody will come in to try to rob us. And we won't have to check our blood pressure or take those nasty vitamin drinks because there will be no more illness and no more disease. But having said that about heaven, What would you say if I told you heaven, the place of many mansions, God's house, the place where there are no more tears, no death, nor sorrow, no crying, no more pain, the place of peace, love, and joy would be the location of one of the greatest wars that would ever be fought. Now you may say that that is impossible, but believe me, it's true. You see, it's a war that we first read of in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 when God tells a serpent that you will bruise the seeds the child Jesus' heel but he will bruise your head yes heaven is a special place it's a sacred place but because God is there it it must also be a sin free place that is why today we are going to learn that Satan was no longer welcome in heaven just as sin can no longer be welcome in our own lives. So if you'll please join me in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for today, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that we can sing songs as we did, that sin has been broken in our lives because of what you did for us. Lord, my prayer is that your word today would touch us. Lord, it speak to us. Let it encourage us. Let it heal us. In Jesus' glorious and awesome name we pray. Amen. Now, I apologize for not doing this early, but if you have your Bibles, if you want to open up to Revelation chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 12. And if you don't have a Bible, don't worry, because I have the scripture right there on the handout. And as we read this scripture, if I could ask everybody to stand so that we can read it out loud together. And beginning in verse 7, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. 
For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the seal. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time has, is short. If you go ahead and have a seat here. Now, as you remember, we're, we're going through the book of Revelation this year. And last week, we read in Revelation chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, that the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon it was, as it was born. And it's interesting that Satan thought he was smart enough he thought that he was strong enough to wage war against the child and be successful. But as we're going to read throughout the book of Revelation, not only would his attempt prove to be unsuccessful, but it would also prove to be fatal to his own interest. You see, his desire to devour the child would be his downfall. Satan engaged all the power he had against heaven. It says the child and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. As I was doing research and studying for the sermon, I heard a couple people say that you could almost say that there was a war being fought right above the manger in Bethlehem. Michael and his angels against the dragon and his angels. Now, believe it or not, this isn't the first time that Michael and Satan encountered each other. We read in Jude 1.9, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke him. And it's really interesting as you begin to research and study this whole war and this battle that took place between Michael and the Satan, there are different views, different opinions of when this war took place. And as I was doing research, it was really interesting that, because it's very odd to think that Satan might be in heaven. But in Zechariah 3.1, it says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Paul wrote in Ephesians 6.12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. And then he said against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And you could almost say, oh, how the mighty have fallen, because you remember that Satan once was one of the highest ranking angels in heaven before he began his fall. So I think the term, oh, how the mighty have fallen, is very appropriate for this. And as we're going to see throughout the book of Revelation, his fall gets worse and worse. Today we read that he was cast out of heaven. But later on, we're going to read that he, he was bound during the millennium and that it will not be ended until we read in Revelation 20.10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I'm going to get off track for one second because, you know, it's funny when you talk to people about Satan. They always believe that Satan is the ruler of hell. Like Satan kind of runs the shop down there. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that Satan is in control of hell. What we read is that Satan is tormented and he is cast and he basically is sentenced to hell. Because if Satan were in charge of hell, it would be a whole lot different there. So don't ever be deceived or think that, that Satan has any type of power or control outside of God. You see, God still is in control God has ultimate control and authority over everything. But we read that as the Lord prepares to conquer Satan once and for all, he first treads, rids heaven of the dragon. There is no longer a place for Satan in heaven, just as there can no longer be room for sin in our lives. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You see, just as God prepared heaven, we also must prepare our temples for him as well. And as we're going to talk about in a few minutes, church, we cannot 
have sin in our lives and expect God to live in our temple. And if we are to room, have room for Jesus in our lives, church, then we have to make sure that there is no room for sin in our lives. John tells us in Revelation 12, 8, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. You see, Satan was no longer welcome in heaven. And Satan and sin can no longer be welcome in us. And see, church, we have to be aware of this because with each defeat that Satan encounters, he turns his attention and wrath more to us. We're going to read in Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. And I can promise you this, that as we get closer to end times, his attacks will become more and more frequent and more and more severe. And John tells us that there was a struggle on both sides, but ultimately victory fell to Christ and his church through Michael his, and his angels. Because of Christ, Michael and his angels proved to be too powerful. And John tells us in verse 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And not only was the great dragon conquered, but John tells us that he was cast out of heaven. See, there was no more room for Satan in heaven. And just as Satan was cast out, we must do the same thing. You see, it's one thing to say that there's no more room for sin in our lives. But we must keep fighting our spiritual war and cast sin out of our lives. You see, church, I told you last week that we are in a spiritual battle. You might not realize it. You might not want to believe it. But it's a serious battle where no one can be neutral. We have been born into it, and we have but no choice to fight ourselves out of it. We cannot run away from it. And the Bible tells us that this battle that's going on between good and evil is real. And then it will get worse towards the end days. You see, Satan never gives up. He keeps on trying. And just because we may conquer him on Monday, it doesn't mean that he won't come back at us on Tuesday. It's a battle where we must constantly be on guard. It's a battle where we must constantly defend our ground. In church, that's why we must cast sin and we must cast Satan out of our lives. As I said earlier, we are God's temple. And if we expect God to live inside of us, we cannot have sin there because God cannot be associated with sin. That's why when Jesus hung on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God could not be associated with sin. And if we expect the Holy Spirit to live in us, if we expect that seed to grow and flourish, if we expect to be fruitful and bountiful for the Lord, then church, we must cast sin out of our lives. Now hear my heart. I'm not saying that we can be sin free because we can't. But we know that they're meaningful, they're intentional, they're purposeful sin that may be in our lives. And I'm saying if we expect the Holy Spirit to live in us, we must get rid of it. See, church, I don't think we understand just how impactful that can be in us. I know I've told you this before, I was that Christian where I felt like Monday through Friday I could kind of live in this world, Saturday and Sunday I'd be pretty good and then Monday I could go back to being who I was. That's why the Bible tells us we cannot be of this world. See church, we have no place in this world. We're visitors and almost I say it's getting to the point where we're unwelcome guests into this world. But see, I fear as Christians, we spend too much time trying to fit in with people around us. We just want to be accepted. We want to be cool. We want to be liked by people. And unfortunately, we begin to compromise. We begin to let sin. We begin to let Satan into our lives. And the more we let that in, the less room there is 
for Jesus in our lives. Now, church, I'm not saying we need to go out and be these, these people that really stand out and cause trouble, but we don't have to fit into this world. We don't have to be cool. We can cool, be cool being Christians. We can be cool by not swearing. We can be cool by not going on certain websites. We can be cool by not listening to certain music. We can be cool by being Christians, and that's it. And I think we spend too much time worrying that we're going to offend somebody, worrying that we're going to upset somebody. But church, if we act in love and grace, we don't offend anybody. But church, I believe we have to take a stand and we have to say sin is no longer welcome in our lives. Guys, that's why we teach you to bounce your eyes. And your friends may say, oh, you must be weak. You can't handle it. Your answer back to them is, no, I'm just smart. That's why we don't watch certain movies. Because you don't understand the messages that can be put into your mind. I think you all know I'm, I'm the chaplain for a local police department. And yesterday I got called out on a call. A young man committed suicide. And as I was talking to the parents, they said, there's this, and I'm not going to say what it is, there's this one movie. And after he watched this movie, his life changed. He would spend hours and hours watching this movie over and over and over again. And then dad told me, I called, you know, the grandma, I called grandma and I said, something's wrong. He's not the same person anymore. He became an introvert. He became an outcast. He hated society. And yesterday it got too much for him and he killed himself. You might not realize it, but everything of this world has a message. And it's not always good. No, you don't have to go see every movie. No, you don't have to go onto those websites. No, you don't have to listen to that music. <coughs> see, church, if we want God to live in our lives, then we must take a stand. We must cast sin out of our lives. And here in my heart, I know that it isn't an easy thing. You know, it may be easy to say, well, I'm going to stop chewing my, biting my fingernails. But it might not be so easy if you're saying, I'm going to break an addiction. But church, the first step in casting sin out of our lives is to make the decision that sin is no longer welcome in our lives. And church, that's my biggest fear for the church, and I'm not talking about this church, but for God's church. I fear that there are too many churches filled with people that haven't made the decision to cast sin out of their lives. I fear that there are too many churches in this world that have stopped sending the message that we must cast sin out of our lives. I fear that God's word has been watered down so much that we've almost taken the word sin out of the Bible. Now church, hear my heart, I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to convict. But I am here to say we must take a stand against sin. We must take a stand against Satan. We must be willing to say that we will not be like this world. Remember, we're not to be of this world. We live here as Jesus prepares a place for us. But we're never to be worldlike. The Bible tells us that we must be Christ-like. And as the dragon attempts to attack us, he will try many ways to get to us. John tells us here that he is the accuser of our brethren. 
And we can't forget, church, that sometimes Satan will attack us through accusation. It's those messages of you are not worthy for God to love you. It's that message of you are not worthy for God to hear your prayers. It's that message of you're nothing but a big hypocrite. See, church, that's why we must cast <coughs> sin and we must cast Satan out of our lives. Because if we allow him to hang around, we might just begin believing what he is saying to us. Never forget his true intention. His desire is to devour us and to devour our lives. Jesus warned us of that in John 10:10, 10, 10, where he said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Never forget that the Bible tells us that Satan's presence in this world is real. And that he is constantly walking the earth, looking for prey. But it's also a struggle that we must realize that we cannot win on our own. Because it has already been won for us by Jesus. See church, I think too often we get ourselves into trouble by thinking that we can win this battle on our own. By thinking that we are David and we can conquer our Goliath, but we don't need the rock. Just as David needed the rock, we need our rock too, Jesus Christ, in the spiritual battle. Never forget that there will always be deception of the enemy that will tell you that God really doesn't care about you. And if you're going to stop going to church, nobody will ever notice. Know that those are the lies of the enemy. And that's why if you don't come for a couple weeks, you will get a text or a call from me. Not because I want to see why you weren't here, but because I want you to know that you are loved and that you are missed. And you are valued not only by this church, but by God. You see, the enemy wants to isolate us. But God wants to bring us closer. The enemy wants to close the door to heaven for us. But God has already opened that door for us. And I understand that it's really easy to say, cast sin out of your life. But how do we actually do that in real life? Well, in James 4, 7, it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The way John describes it in this passage, it seems really simple. In verse 11, he says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the, by the word of his testimony. You see, i got to believe that this is one of those scriptures that Satan doesn't want us to read. And if you think about it, why do so many Christians not read the book of Revelation? Because it's a scary book, right? Now, how many of you have actually been scared so far this year in the book of Revelation? How many of you have been encouraged and excited by what John is telling us in the book of Revelation? You see, I don't think the enemy wants us to know this passage because I don't think he wants us to know how really easy it is to defeat him. You see, what John tells us is that by the blood of the Lamb and by our testimony, the enemy was defeated. Now, do you realize how powerful God's church would be if we figured that out? Why do you think the enemy doesn't want us to come to church? Why do you think the enemy doesn't want us to read the Bible? Why do you think the enemy keeps trying to cut the book of Revelation out of the Bible? Because he doesn't want us to know just how powerless he is. And more importantly, he doesn't want us to know just how powerful God is. And that's why if you underline or highlight in your Bible, I want you to underline or highlight verse 11. As a reminder to you, when you think that the enemy is gaining control, when you think that the enemy is having victory, I want you to read that passage and remind yourself just how powerless he is. But also remind yourself just how powerful God is. Regardless of what the enemy may say, regardless of the lies he may tell. Satan is not equal to God. Satan is not as powerful to God. I read this sign this week. 
It says, I know the Lord can't give me anything I can't handle. I just wish he didn't trust me as much. Amen. And have you ever been in that spot where like you're getting trialed and you're getting tested? You're like, man, I know the Lord trusts me, but I just wish he wouldn't trust me that much. And the problem is when we get to that point, we feel like we're doing it all on our own. And church, we have to understand that there's nothing that we can do in this battle. James says, submit yourself to the Lord. We submit ourselves to the Lord and by the blood of the lamb, we are free. By the blood of the lamb, we are victorious. By the blood of the lamb, Satan is defeated. Now, there's one other piece though that John talks about and sometimes we forget about it. Yes, we are victorious by the blood of the lamb. But there's something else that Satan hates a lot. And John tells it's, it's our testimony. You see, as we go through these trials, as we grow through these temptations, as we go through our problems and crises in life, never forget that God is preparing a powerful testimony that will be used in the name of Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't know when. Maybe you don't know how. But as we go through those trials and as we are successful by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord is equipping us with a powerful weapon. And that is a testimony. See, church, how we are powerful is by allowing the Holy Spirit to grow and build into our lives. How we are powerful is by allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us. Just as we talk to the little, you know, to the kids, you know, that, that there's a seed that is planted in their heart, and we pray that, that it's watered, and it's fed, and it's grown. Church, that's the same thing for us. How we are powerful is by allowing that seed that the Spirit has planted in us to grow and be strong and powerful. We water and feed it with the Word of God. We water and feed it by spending time with God. We water and feed it by being in fellowship with people here at church. You see, the Spirit has been planted in each and every one of us. But it's not the same in each and every one of us. It's up to us to care for it, to nurture it, to allow it to grow. And as God does that, we will be blessed with a powerful and powerful message. John says in verse 11, And they did not love their lives to death, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Never forget that Satan is subject to Jesus' name. Never forget that Satan has been defeated by the blood of the Lamb. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Maybe you've never really noticed it, but there is something to that song that says there's power in the blood. <laughs> if we are to overcome Satan and sin, we must realize that we can overcome Satan and sin in our lives. Church, we can overcome sin in our lives. And church, I believe that so much, I want you to repeat that with me right now. We can overcome sin in our lives. And as you go about your day-to-day -day activities, I want you to say that to yourself. The next time Satan tries to tempt you with something in your eyes, I want you to say, I can overcome sin in my life. The next time you have a family member or friend that tries to get you to do something that you know is not right, I want you to say, I can and will overcome sin in my life. The next time something pops up on your computer or somebody sends you a picture that you know you shouldn't be looking at, I want you to shout out, I can and I will overcome sin in my life. See church, we have forgotten just how powerful we are because we've been deceived into thinking that sin and Satan are powerful. But church, as you leave church today, I want you to cry out, I can overcome sin and Satan in my life. But church, it just can't be words. You must believe it. You must have faith in it.
Church, you must understand that Satan's trying to wage a war that he's already lost. It's like, you guys know I love the Red Sox, and I was telling people earlier today, I'm feeling really good because we're only 18 and a half games out, and we have a whole month left. So the way I see it, it's like if we win every game, and everybody else in our division loses every game, we're in again, right? That's the kind of battle that Satan's trying to convince us that he can win. He's trying to convince us that he can win something that he's already lost. So that's why I'm saying, don't spend time with him. Don't listen to him. He's worthless. He's useless. And because of the blood of the Lamb, he will never be victorious. Sin opens the door to the devil in our lives. But remember, the blood of the Lamb closes that door in our lives. The next time Satan tells you you're not worthy, you might not agree with this. You know what I say? Tell him you're absolutely right. But because of the blood of the Lamb, I am made worthy. Michael and his angels did not fight with their own strength and authority. They found their, faith, their strength and their authority in the blood of the Lamb. Church, remember, there is no sin that is too great that cannot be overcome by the blood of the Lamb. In 1 John 1, 7, it says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Never forget that when Jesus died, He defeated death. But as you leave today, the question is, do you want to overcome sin in your life? Are you ready to overcome sin in your life? No, I'm not saying that with one simple prayer it will be wiped out. But I am saying, are you ready to make a decision? A decision to eliminate sin from your life. You might not be able to stop it on your own. But that's why God has blessed us with counselors, with doctors, with pastors, with professionals that can help you. But the decision you must make is, are you ready to pick up the phone and make a call? Are you ready and willing to make that decision? Are you ready to state, I can and will overcome sin in my life? Are you ready to allow the blood of the Lamb to cover you, to cleanse you, to strengthen you? Michael and his angels overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Church, never forget how powerful your testimony is. Never forget how destructive it can be to Satan's attempts. But church, also never forget how healing it can be to the person that God has placed in front of you. Yes, God may allow Satan to test your testimony, but God will never allow Satan to defeat your testimony. Hold true to your testimony just as you hold true to Jesus. Don't allow sin to destroy your testimony. And always remember that your testimony is one of the most powerful weapons we have. Just as Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.27, nor give place to the devil. Don't allow sin or Satan to have any place inside of his temple. Don't allow that door to be opened by him, but keep it shut by the blood of the Lamb. If you're ready not to give place to the devil, then you must take the first step. John tells us in 1, 9, uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe right now you're sitting there and you may be saying, PK, I, you don't understand my situation. PK, yeah, I know you're, you're, you're talking about some sin, but you don't know my sin. 
PK, there's no way that I can break this sin. I've tried on my own. I've tried everything. I've tried 12 steps programs. I've tried whatever. But PK, you don't understand. There is no way that this sin can be stopped. PK, if there was any way, I would have done it by now. But never forget what Paul wrote in Romans 6.20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. See, church, if there's sin in your life that has been there for a long time, if there's sin in your life that you seem to struggle with and never seem to get victory over, if there's sin in your life that over years has just pulled you deeper and deeper into it, then my question to you is, have you allowed God to crush it under your feet? If there's sin right now that you haven't been able to break free from, maybe it's time to let God break you free from it. Remember, don't believe the lies of Satan because we can and we will overcome sin in our lives. And just as Satan was no longer welcome in heaven, church, from this day forward, we must say, that sin is no longer welcome in our lives. Jared and Rick, if you want to come on up here. And as we go into this time of worship right now, here's what I want. Don't feel that you need to sing. But if this is a time right now you need to spend with the Lord, if this is a time right now where you've been struggling with something and you want to spend time with the Lord, call upon the Spirit. Ask for that strength and that encouragement. Ask for that covering and protection. Ask for God to come in and crush Satan under your feet. Remember, yes, the serpent would bruise the seed's heel. But God also promised us that that seed would come back and bruise the serpent's head. Church, if there's sin right now in your life, Spend time with the Lord right now. Allow the blood of the Lamb to cover you. Allow the blood of the Lamb to comfort you. Allow the blood of the Lamb to heal you. See, church, don't believe the lies of Satan. You no longer have to live with that sin in your life. You can overcome it. The question is, are you ready to allow the Lord to defeat it for you? Yes. 
testimony be strong and powerful. Please join us for some fellowship right now. If you need prayer, please come on up. Uh, I'll be up here. Jared will be up here. Jamie will be up here. And Janine, if you need prayer, we want to pray with you. God bless you guys. We love you guys. And go out and have a great week. <laughs> we hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a Foursquare Christian Church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626-914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.